Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 55th Blueheads Virtual Seminar. Blueheads Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blueheads Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Yenot Adela, a general physician and first aid trainer from, from Blue Health Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Yarit Getacho here with us to give us a session on the topic of Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. So Dr. Yarit Getacho is an assistant professor of dermatology and venerology at Harma University. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Yeno. As uh, Dr. Ehene have mentioned, I'm um, uh, Yari, the dermatologist from Harama University. Uh, today, we will uh, discuss about the highlights of uh, epidermal necrolysis, especially this uh, severe uh, drug adverse reaction called uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis. So uh, this is the outline of uh, my presentation. We'll discuss about the introduction, introduction about the general uh, information about Stephen Johnson syndrome and uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis, the epidemiology, what brings uh, this disease entity, highlight of the pathogenesis, clinical manifestation, and the approach. So, uh, as an introduction, this uh, TN and Stephen Johnson syndrome are uh, an acute life threatening mucocutaneous reaction. And they are said to be the severe form of adverse drug reaction, nearly uh, caused by uh, drug reactions. And sometimes it can be due to infections and idiopathic causes have been uh, reported. And uh, when you see their presentation, they usually present with extensive uh, detachment of the epidermis or the upper layer of the skin and the mucosal epithelium uh, on the human body. And when you see the difference between uh, TN and Stephen Johnson syndrome, their difference is mainly on the extent of uh, skin detachment. For example, if we see uh, in this picture, when it involves the skin detachment is involving less than 10% of uh, body surface area, we call it Stephen Johnson syndrome. And overlap, Stephen Johnson syndrome, TN overlap is said to be when it involves between 10% and 30% of the body surface area. And if it's greater than 30%, it's said to be TA. And this is based on uh, the, the same disease spectrum based on surface area of the detachment. When it comes to the epidemiology, the overall incidence is said to be one to two, six per million per people annually for Stephen Johnson syndrome and 0 0.4 up to 1.2 cases and uh, annually. And when you see the age distribution, it can occur at any age from infancy to old age, but it's higher in those with age above 65 years of uh, age. And when you see also the epidemiology, in fact, the causes in children is said to be the infectious one than that of the older. And the sex distribution is more uh, prominent on uh, females due to different hormonal uh, factors and others. So uh, first to see the etiology or triggers that can cause Stephen Johnson syndrome or TN, around 80% uh, are caused by uh, drugs, which is the main one being antibiotics. So the sulfur drugs are said to be the main cause of Stephen Johnson syndrome and TA, and uh, followed by other drugs like steroids, uh, anticonvulsants, especially the aromatic type of anticonvulsants, antiretrovirals, antiretrovirals like nevirapine, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, which we'll see them in detail, and uh, allopurinol are safe to be the top one in causing Stephen Johnson syndrome in TA. And when you see, uh, even though rare, it's safe to be less than 15% infection, other disease and idiopathic accounts for the other triggering factors, 
the mycoplasma pneumonia is said to be the major one, especially in pediatric age group, and other viral infections like cytomegalovirus, hepatitis A, human herpes virus, southern EBV, and others has to be as mentioned as a triggering factor uh, for SGS. And when it comes to the uh, vaccination, the SLA and bone marrow are other causes. Sometimes it can be idiopathic. So uh, when it's the most commonly implicated drugs, as I tried to mention earlier, the sulfonamides, especially the cotrimoxazole is said to be the main cause of uh, SGS and TN. Anticonvulsants that are the aromatic one, like carbamazepine, phenytoin, are uh, said to be involved in uh, SGS management. When you see uh, the level of uh, risk for these drugs, we can classify them as a high risk, a moderate risk, and drugs that with no uh, risk for SGS. So the high risk include the allopurinone, the cotrimoxazole, nevirapine, carbamazepine, and the nonsteroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs that are said to be the oxycam types. There are different types, the oxycam, the acetic side, and the others. But those, the oxycam, like the meloxicam, are said to be high risk for the development of Steven Johnson syndrome. Penobarbital and penetrin are also included in high risk uh, drugs for the development of uh, SGS and TA. So when it comes to moderate risks, the cephalosporins, macrolides, tetracyclines, and the acetic acid type of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is the commonest one, being uh, the diclofenac, which is available in our setup, is said to be moderate risk. But some drugs are said to be with no risk of uh, state SGS and TA. This includes the beta blockers, AC inhibitors, uh, sulfonylia, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially the propionic acid types, which is the prototype is being ibuprofen, is said to be drugs with no risk for the development of uh, Steven Johnson syndrome and uh, TA. So uh, when it comes to uh, risk factors, uh, HIV AIDS has been mentioned as a major risk factor for the development of SGS and TA. Uh, studies show that HIV infection has 1,000 times higher risk of having uh, SGS than uh, normal uh, individuals. And uh, when you see the genetic factors, special, especially in the Southern East Asia part, those with uh, Han Chinese having HLA-B1502 and 1508 are said to be high, at high risk of developing SGS, especially uh, nowadays in the US, those from South East Asia have to have to be tested for this HLA uh, involvement for uh, the risk of uh, SGS before starting any aromatic anticonvulsants. The other are uh, malignancies like HCC, Langsia are said to be associated. Physical factors like sunlight exposure and radiation therapy, those on malignancy are said to be at high risk of uh, developing HCC. SGS and TA. When you see uh, there, even though there are uh, some doubts about the high dose and rapid introduction of medication, some study uh, put this uh, factor as another risk factor for the development of uh, SGS and TA. So uh, I'll come to the question and answer after I discussed about the others. So when you come to the pathogenesis, the precise molecular and pathogenesis is not uh, known, but it has been partially explained. There are uh, three hypotheses about the pathogenesis of uh, SGS and TN and T cell uh, stimulation. The first one is the, the Hapton, uh, pro Hapton uh, concept. In this concept, what it says is the drug are not the pathogenic by themselves, rather than they will become an immunogenic when they bind to a protein and by forming a new antigen. So this new antigen will activate this immune uh, reaction in uh, some individuals. The PI concept and the altered peptide uh, concept or hypothesis suggests that uh, there is uh, drugs are directly communicating with the immune receptors. And in the alternative peptide uh, theory, 
the peptide HLA association is highly uh, specific than the other. So this, by these three hypotheses, they will uh, undergo apoptosis of the keratinocytes. Other pathogen uh, factors are involved in the pathogens are the gra granulosin, the perforating granzyme B, the fast ligand and annexin are associated with uh, apoptosis of keratinocytes by interacting with CD8 T cells and natural uh, killer cell. So with this uh, dead keratinocytes, there will be uh, a formation of intraepidermal blister and this blister will uh, rupture and causes uh, scalding and uh, exfoliation of uh, the skin, as you can see in this uh, picture. So saying this, uh, the clinical presentations have uh, different phases. The first one is the prodermal phase followed by the acute phase and the late and the chronic sequelae uh, phases. So when you see the prodermal fit, the first one, uh, it usually said it said that the drug exposure has to be between four and twenty eight days. But some suggest up to three months. The uh, duration of exposure can be uh, with the culprit drug can can be uh, seen. But within the four and twenty eight days are the most accept acceptable. And the drugs that have been used for the past four up to twenty eight days are the most suggestive drugs for the cause of uh, SGS and TA. And when you see the prodermal phase, it usually occurs one up to three days before the onset of the mucocutaneous or the skin and mucosal uh, findings. So generally they present with non-specific symptoms like the flu-like symptoms, high fever, malaise, myalgia, arthralgia. And some patients also take as a flu symptom and some drugs that can be uh, confused with the drug that causes SGS. And the other uh, main symptom in the prodermal phase is there is uh, cutaneous pain and burning sensation over different areas of the skin, which is uh, indicative of the impending necrolysis and blister formation uh, in these patients. <clears throat> so when it comes to the acute phase, uh, the generally patients present with a dusky red and erythematous, painful, sometimes tender uh, skin lesions, as you can see uh, in this picture. The uh, initial lesions usually present symmetrically on the trunk and the face. And sometimes, as you can see in this picture, they have atypical uh, target wear lesions. From this picture, you can see there is a central uh, have more hyperpigmented lesion and peripherally uh, pale lesion, which we call it the atypical target wave lesion of SGS and TA, which can be seen in other diseases also. Then uh, these lesions will uh, proceed to have a bullet that can have uh, initially that can be tense, but progressively will have uh, will develop to a more flaccid type of uh, bullet that will rupture in progress. This, the, when you see the progress of the erythema, this, the purpura and the lesions, they are said to be very rapid. They can progress within hours to days. Usually up to four days will take, up to five days it will take to involve the whole body. Usually they spare the distal aspects of the arm and uh, the legs, but the palm and the soul can be involved. As, as you can see in this picture, this patient has a dusky red retema, the spirit lesion over the trunk, the breast, and uh, genital area. So uh, this is the progress of uh, the bullous lesions or the blisters. As you can see earlier, it was a tense blister that will proceed to a flaccid blister that can easily be ruptured to form a denude and scalded like burn like lesion over the trunk. And in these patients, there is what we call Nicholas design positive. That means with uh, shearing, uh, with pressure, the epidermis will be uh, detached from the skin easily. This is uh, this not specific for uh, SGS. It can be seen in other uh, bullous uh, disorders. But what we have to know is on pressure areas and with friction, these uh, bullous lesions will uh, rupture and cause like lesions. 
This is uh, an Ethiopian patient present with SJCNTN. As you can see, she has a widespread uh, exfoliating skin, and on the arms, there are still intact uh, blisters and areas of uh, exfoliation in this patient. Uh, when you see the other uh, manifestation is the mucosal uh, involvement. The mucosal lesions are found about in 90% of SGS or uh, TN uh, cases, and the, it can occur either concurrently with the skin uh, presentation or after the onset of uh, skin manifestation. So when you see uh, the first one is the oral lesion, so the oral lesion especially start with a painful and erythematous lesion, then progress with to erosion over the mucosal areas. After that, they will have uh, hemorrhagic crusts and sometimes a whitish uh, pseudomembranous type of uh, crustacean over the mucosal area. As you can see in this patient over the lip, does have a uh, hemorrhagic crustacean and here the pseudomembranous type of uh, crustacean. The commonest areas are said to be the tongue and the hard palate, but it can also involve the lip, the vermilion, and other uh, mucosal involvements, which we will see uh, in the next slide. So uh, the other mucosal involvement is the ocular or the ophthalmology uh, complications. So these patients uh, start with photophobia, conjunctivitis, and uh, discharge in the initial uh, initially. Then within up to 50, up to 90 percent, we'll have a chronic sequelae. They can have a corneal ulceration that, uh, that may progress to visual impairment and uh, blindness. And uh, this, in the second lesion, what we see is a genital uh, mucosal lesion in a woman having SJS and T. And some other involvement in the mucosa are in the in severe cases, the patients can have uh, dysphagia due to the involvement of esophagus. They can have the nasal, the pharynx, and the bronchial involvement is also common. And these patients are uh, difficult having to talk, even eat and other. When you see the systemic involvement, uh, in 15% of the cases, uh, there can be a pulmonary involvement. The earliest sign of pulmonary involvement is the elevated respiratory rate and the cough. But when it's complicated and with time, the patients can develop uh, ARDS, which is fatal for uh, the patient in has high mortality rate. And when it comes to the GI involvement, epithelial necrosis, esophagus, small bowel, and colon can be seen. Patients can have a profuse diarrhea, bleeding, and perforation which is uh, fatal for the patient. And they can also have proteinuria, hematuria, azotemia, and may progress to uh, renal failure due to uh, different factors occurring in SGS. So the first acute complication we should look for is sepsis. These patients are, has lost their primary defense, the epidermis, so they are at high risk of uh, sepsis. And with this inflammatory uh, process, they can be, the immunity will be uh, decreased, so they are prone to uh, sepsis. And due to the increased uh, transpidermal water loss and hypercatabolic state, these patients will have a shock, electrolyte uh, disturbance that may further progress to multi organ failure like renal failure and the others. When you see com pulmonary complication in acute phases, they can have pneumonia, and that may progress to ARDS. GI bleeding, perforation, which can be a risk for uh, anemia, are said to be associated with SGS. Uh, and thromboembolism in DIC is the other main field complication in patients with uh, severe drug reaction like TN and SGS. When, when we come to the complication and the long-term sequelae, as I tried to mention earlier, about 50 to 90% of the patients with ocular involvement will have uh, chronic sequelae over their eyes, the commonest one uh, being the fibrosis, entropion, and corneal ulceration, 
but in severe cases, they may have visual impairment and uh, blindness. And when you come to the other common involvement of this SGS and TN is the nail uh, complications. So initially in the acute phase, they may have exfoliating nails, but in, when you come persistent, they can have uh, dystrophy, permanent anonychia, pterygium, raging, and pigmentary changes are said to be associated in the chronic long-term sequelae of uh, SGS. And uh, when you see in the genital involvement, especially the mucosal involvement, patients can have pain during uh, sexual intercourse, vaginal dry dryness, and in severe cases, adhesions can occur in the vulva and vaginal uh, mucosa. If there is a severe involvement in the GI system, they can develop structures in different areas like the esophagus, the intestine, and the anal area. And chronic uh, lung disease and obstructive lung disease are said to be another uh, long-term sequelae of uh, SGS and TA. So uh, when it comes to the prognosis of uh, SGS, both SGS, the SGS TN overlap in TN has a high mortality rate. And when they come at emergency OPD in our setup, there is what we call a score 10, the severity of illness score for TN. And this has different uh, parameters into that, around seven parameters, which are 1.4 each. So age greater than 40 years, the presence of malignancy, it can be a solid organ or hematologic malignancy. If the heart rate is above 120, and if the initial detachment, that means when they present to the emergency on day and day one, if the detachment or the of the skin or the epidermis is greater than 10%, BUN greater than 28, if there is hyperglycemia with value of uh, greater than 252 milligram per uh, deciliter and bicarbonate level less than 20 are the main component of scorten and each having 1.4 dental phase. So when you see uh, how to evaluate the mortality rate, those patients with score 10 of uh, one, and those that are said to be mortality rate of uh, 3.2. And when the score 10 is two, it's said to be around 12.1% of mortality rate. And greater than five is said to be 90% of mortality rate uh, for that patient. So these uh, indicators or parameters are said to be sensitive for the evaluation of mortality rate in patients with uh, TA. Generally, when you see the mortality of uh, epidermolytic uh, necrolysis, it reaches about 27%, but specifically for SGS, some say it's one up to 5% of mortality rate, but can reach up to 10%, and for the overlap about 40%, and those who develop TN will have around 50% of uh, mortality rate. But this mortality rate is dependent on different factors like the age and underlying disease the patient is having during uh, the onset of SGS and TA. So when you come to the diagnosis, unlike other diseases, SGS and TA are, are not diagnosed with laboratory investigation. It's a clinical diagnosis we saw from the patient, from the history, we get that any uh, culprit drug within the past four up to 28 days. And if there is a previous history of drug reaction and considering other uh, differential diagnosis and our, our physical examination. Right. So the laboratory investigations are very important to see the severity and to evaluate the prognosis of the patient and for daily management and follow-up, especially in patients that are in intensive care units. and. Sometimes it, can, it is also important to see the systemic involvement as well. We have seen there are different organ involvement in SGS and TA. So till now, there is no uh, reliable and validated in vitro or diagnostic tests for SGS and TA. There are uh, some tests like the allergologic tests, but uh, which we'll see them uh, later. So in our setup, especially in health facility, facilities like Ethiopia, we have to do a CBC. So from CBC, we expect, expect anemia and 
sometimes neutropenia unless they have uh, sepsis. And organ function test is involved, very important to see uh, renal failure involvement and liver uh, tox liver function test uh, abnormalities. It says to be uh, higher this in, in renal function failure. Electrolyte and ceramuria are very important, as we have mentioned, due to the stress and other uh, cofactors. Patients can have uh, hyperglycemia, and as we have discussed around the score 10, if it's greater than 252, it's said to be a poor prognostic sign. And histopathology is very important. So, from the pathogenesis that apoptotic keratinocytes, vesiculation, and uh, mononuclear cell infiltration can be seen in the histopathology of uh, these patients. So the new investigative modalities for early marker of SGS and TN are uh, the soluble fast ligand, the perforin, uh, granulosin, and soluble CD40 uh, ligands. But the granulosin is the most useful uh, marker by using the immunochromatography for these patients, but they are still on the investigative, uh, but still on uh, research area, not practical one. So uh, discussing the typical physical and clinical presentation of SJS and the TA, we have to make sure that other etiologies and other disorders have to be ruled out. So the most common one is erythema multiforme major, and uh, in this side, in erythema multiforme major, when you say major, there is involvement of the mucosa. So they are usually uh, acrally uh, distributed and they can have atypical targets like we have seen in SJC and TA. And the major cause of erythema multiforme is uh, infectious disease, especially the viral infections like HSV and uh, the Mucosal involvement is milder than that of SGS and TA. And systemic features are milder, or we may not get the systemic involvement in case of erythema uh, multiforme majors. And usually, these patients with erythema multiforme major have a previous history of uh, same lesion over the mucosal or in the cutaneous area. The other is uh, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, which affects usually children caused by bacterial uh, infections. So patients present with uh, epidermal peeling. So when you see the age distribution, even though SJS and TN occurs at any age, this occurs in infants and uh, children. Others can be different bullous uh, disorders like pemphigus vulgaris, bullous pemphigoid, and uh, other drug eruption. But what we have to make sure is that we have to see dress syndrome, which is drug reaction, with a morbidly for uh, rash and bullous lesions, but they usually present with facial edema and uh, frank mucosal and epidermal detachment. And on CBC, we can see uh, <clears throat> other diagnostic clues. Okay, saying this, uh, we have to, when you come to the management part, the main components or the package for uh, the management of uh, SJ Centene are the first and the main one is we have to do a prompt withdrawal of the drug or the culprit drug has to be withdrawn. And unlike other drug reactions, here we can do uh, rechallenging or other uh, techniques to see the cause of the drug. There are some parameters like uh, what we call the Alden casualty score which shows which drug is very uh, casual to cause SJC and TA. It does have different uh, components and with a score of greater than four can tell us the drug not to confuse with uh, the different drugs if the patient is taking multiple uh, medications. So initial assessment has to be uh, followed like burn and we have to follow the ABCDE, the airway, the breathing, the circulation and the other Initial assessment is very important, like an emergency cases. And if referral is needed, if you cannot manage it, if it needs as ICU management, we have to uh, refer the patient. And there are some supportive uh, in the treatment and investigations, followed by initiation of disease modifying therapies, uh, which we'll discuss it later. So when it comes to uh, the supportive care, 
The first one is the fluid replacement. So these patients, SJC and TN patients, are said to be uh, treated with a parkland formula, that's 4 ml per kg times the body surface area. And the first half should be given in eight hours and followed by that. And we have to make sure giving this uh, fluid replacement, ring lactate and normal saline are the recommended one, but we have to follow the urine uh, output as I maintain the maintenance of the urine output between 1,000 and 1,500 is recommended for uh, each patient because these patients are uh, very liable for developing uh, pulmonary edema and other complications. So in addition to the fluid rep replacement, since there is a high uh, transpidermal water loss and they are in high hypercatabolic state, they, we have to uh, correct the electrolytic imbalance we see in these patients. When you come to uh, the nutritional support, uh, it's usually said that patients have to take oral uh, oral meal, but if there is an involvement of the oral mucosa, the esophagus, and others, those with having dysphagia, inability to uh, feed, we can use energy tube or for the feeding of these patients. And uh, when you see the calorie intake, it's said to be, we have to maintain from 30 up to 35 kilocalorie per kg per day. And we, they have to get a high protein diet uh, to for my, in managing uh, SGS. <clears throat> so when you see the environment, some suggest from 28 degrees Celsius up to uh, 32, and some say 28 up to 30, but most suggest that in this patient, this has to be in an environment with a temperature of 30 up to 32 because they, we have to prevent the hyper, hypercatabolic state they will uh, get. And uh, especially, we have to monitor them with vital signs and we have to check the fluid intake and the urine outputs by maintaining from 1,000 to 5,500. As we can see, the one complication is hyperglycemia. We have to do like glucose, electrolyte, and since they are level for organ failures, we have to do renal function and others. And blood cultures are usually recommended in advanced setups, especially if within the first uh, uh, 24, 48 hours, we have to, initially you have to do the blood culture and followed by after 48 hours. But if they are in an advanced setup and having a barrier nursing, that means if they are isolated from other patients with high uh, infection uh, prevention. And so, uh, we have to look for complications like uh, thromboembolism, DIC, sepsis, and ARDS and multi-organ uh, failures. So coming to the prevention of infection, barrier nursing, that means the isolation of the patients with high uh, infection prevention. So the nurse have to use uh, hand hygiene using uh, different antiseptics and the frequent catheterizing has to be uh, minimized. And we have to... Uh, cautiously check the focus of sepsis and other uh, cause of uh, septicemia and uh, DIC. So even though antibiotics uh, is not recommended right and left for all patients, there are uh, some uh, reporters that have uh, uh, that I've uh, encountered. So the indications to use antibiotics in the best setups is said to be if the patient has high bacterial count from the skin or catheter sample, and if there is a sudden hypothermia in a relative stable patient, confused mental state, anxiety, and excitement, especially if the patient starts to develop these uh, unstable uh, sign symptoms after four days, we are uh, it's a clear indication for the use of antibiotics. And if there is a symptom of infection, it can be UTI or pneumonia, we have to uh, use. Uh, antibiotics for these patients, but we don't have to use right in the left for all patients. But when it comes to uh, our setup, uh, generally prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotic therapy is not recommended for these patients, but in setups like our hospital and in general or other hospitals, we don't have a barrier nursing and the infection prevention is very poor. So with if the patient has a wide speed of 
uh, skin involvement, especially some said if greater than 50%, it's said to be one recommendation to use a prophylactic antibiotic in the initial or the first day. And if we do have a slightest clinical suspicion of sepsis, we have to start a prophylactic antibiotic. And with this, it's said to be that we have to combine three antibiotics like anti those with having anti-staphylococcal uh, activity, gram-negative activity, and anaerobic activity are said to be combined. But we have to be cautious that using these antibiotics, we have to make sure that uh, the drug that causes SGS and TN are not among these drugs and they don't have cross-reactivity between uh, these drugs. Otherwise, we can worsen the condition of SGS and TN uh, in these patients. So when you come to uh, the other major component, especially in relation to dermatology, the first one is wound care. So if the patient has a detached or detachable epidermis, we don't have to remove that one because it will help us as a natural uh, dressing, it will decrease uh, sepsis and infection. It will decrease the transepidermal water loss and prevent uh, progression to uh, shock. And we have to clean the wounds with normal saline and clean water. And some suggest that using the genitian violet or particle GV in our setup is also very important since it has a uh, broad antiseptic effect. And frequent positioning is very important to avoid uh, pressure ulcers. When you come to the specific dressings, they don't have to be uh, adhesive because it will cause the shearing and facilitate the detachment of the epidermis. And in our setup, we can use paraffin and petrolatum gel uh, on egos. But in uh, Western setups, they can use, they use uh, antibiotic integrated. Uh, dressings with this paraffin and pesrolatum uh, gel. <clears throat> the other major components of treatment are the ophthalmology care and respiratory care. So it has to be a multidisciplinary management. So ophthalmologists and pulmonologists have to be involved if they are available. And uh, due to the stress, we have, they can have a GI ulcer. So we have to use for all patients antiacids like H2 receptor antagonists and PPIs. And when it comes to analgesic, as we have discussed on the clinical uh, manifestation, these lesions are very painful and tender to touch. So they have to get uh, an important uh, anti-pain like opioids and morphine. But we have to make sure that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have to be avoided, especially the oxycam types are the high risk drugs. Generally, we have to avoid all type of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in these patients. And the other thing is these patients are at risk of uh, thromboembolism and yes, you have to use uh, anticoagulation. Uh, coming to uh, the specific treatment of these patients, uh, the first one, which is available in our setup is corticosteroid that can be dexamethasone IV or prednisolone uh, PO. But there is still a controversy in the use of uh, corticosteroids. Uh, some say that uh, there is no benefit on uh, prevent decreasing the mortality rate. And uh, in addition to this one, other uh, literature suggests that these corticosteroids will increase the risk of sepsis and it will uh, impede or decrease or delay the wound healing process in these patients. And other and Many uh, studies will uh, suggest that uh, giving steroids, especially prednisolone or dexamethasone or methyl prednisolone IV with, with a high dose for a short period of time is very important in suppressing the inflammatory reaction the patients are having. So they will suggest using one milligram per kg per day of uh, dexamethasone IV for seven days or prednisolone, some literature say at three days, some suggest up to uh, five days of using high dose uh, prednisolone to prevent and decrease the mortality rate. Uh, the other treatment options are the IV immunoglobulin. It's said to be high dose of IV immunoglobulin for uh, up to four days is said to be given. And cyclosporin, which is uh, an important immunosuppressive treatment given with three up to five milligram uh, per kg uh, body weight and plasma or hemodialysis and anti-TNF anti agents like 
ethanol tricept have to be uh, given in these patients, but there is no standard uh, management guideline for the treatment of SGS. And these patients, what we have to know is we have to admit them, especially if the surface area is greater than 10%, and we have uh, to admit them either in the ICU or in the burn unit, and they have to be treated like burn. And accordingly, we can use the antibiotics and the steroids, and if possible, IVIG and cyclosporine are uh, recommended. So when it comes to uh, the summary of treatment, the first one is we have to uh, discontinue all the offending drugs, all the culprit drugs that are associated with SJC and TN have to be uh, discontinued immediately. And if especially greater than 10% involvement of the skin, we have to admit to ICU or burn unit. We have to correct the fluid imbalance and uh, nutritional supplement is very important with high calorie and high protein diets. And secondary infections have to be followed and with indications, we have to give them antibiotics. Ophthalmology, urology, uh, respiratory care are uh, very important. And with the long-term uh, complications like scar and contractures have to be removed by physiotherapy and wound care has to be the main uh, management principle. And as I've tried to mention earlier, there are some disease modifying agents like IV immunoglobin and steroids, K-nephalpha inhibitors have to be uh, given. And uh, these are uh, my references. Uh, thank you so much for your attentions. I think I do have some questions and the Q and A. Shall I proceed to yeah, the question? Yeah, okay. we can proceed to the Q&A section. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay. So uh, the first one is there is no consensus on the duration of drug exposure to develop SGS and TA. And it, it is uh, individualized and there is no uh, strict cut line or cut, cut off point to say, they have to be exposed for this time of duration. There is no study like that. So the Samuel Adana, does the clinical manifestation correlated with the dose or amount of ingestion or exposure of the dose and amount of ingestion? Or, no, uh, it doesn't have to. It's not dose uh, dependent. If we have the drug and if they can either for a new antigen with the protein, or if they can directly interact with the uh, uh, immune, uh, immune uh, forming the immune receptors, they can cause uh, disease. But some there are studies that suggest high dose and frequent uh, rapid ingestion of uh, these drugs are associated as a risk factors, but uh, it's not even now a clear, uh, there is no clear study about the dose but some suggest high dose and rapid. I think uh, anonymous attendee, I think I have um, mentioned the differential diagnosis about the plus skin and the differential. Samuel Adana, uh, of course, different foods have been suggested to, as a cause of SJ but uh, it, Does giving an antidote for a causing drugs has any positive effect on the outcome? Rather, uh, itself. I'm not sure what the question is. We are not here. We are not talking about uh, toxicity or uh, poisonous uh, drugs. Rather, it is an immunologic process. So, antidote for a drug is not uh, has no place in the management or in the prevention of uh, SGS. The antidote is very important for poisoning and other uh, poisoning related drugs. Okay. Uh, is of course are effective than. Uh, again, Samuel Adana in the management of. Uh, the pain. We don't use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 
like I tried to mention, they are categorized as high risk and in the moderate risk. Only ibuprofen is said to be those without uh, risk to have SGS and tail. So generally, we don't consider non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in the management of pain in SGS and tail. We have to uh, remove these drugs because they are potentially causing a drug reaction. Uh, uh, previously, it was said to be erythema multiforme and SGS are said to be in the same category, but currently when it is a pathogenesis, initially the erythema multiforme is associated with uh, associated with infectious diseases like especially viral infections. And when we see the distribution of the lesion, usually it's as a anacral uh, distribution in addition to the mucosal one, especially the major. And the mucosal involvement in erythema multiforme is milder than that of SGSNTN. And when you say SGSNTN, there's a widespread, severe uh, drug reaction, special. And in addition to that, they have a systemic involvement in the current classification is uh, classified as erythema multiforme major as another disease entity, unlike SGSNTN. I have to a clear way to differentiate from drug reaction. I think uh, drug reactions can be mild or severe, but I'm not sure the clear way to different. This is a drug reaction. There is no clear way. Sorry, I, I'm not sure about the question. SGS and TN are said to be in 80%. So they are drug reaction. I'm not sure about you wanted to ask uh, from anaphylactic reactions, I think he corrected it in the next question. Clear way to differentiate from anaphylactic reactions. Okay. Sure. Uh, maybe there are different types of drug reactions. For example, it's, it will uh, start from the morbi morbidly for the dress and the other pustular uh, dermatosis. The, cl the clinical manifestation are very uh, different. The, one with dress, what we call dress, is very similar to EA, TA, but the systemic involvement, and especially in CBC, the eosinophils and other are suggestive of dress rather than uh, TA and the SGS. Otherwise, other drug reactions like the mobility form brush, uh, what we call the AGIP, acute generalized exanthematous pustulis, are different uh, man clinical manifestations are than that of uh, SGS. We don't see SGS in TA, pustules are not common presentation, the distribution and the progress are very different than Egypt. Rather, dress is very uh, similar to that. Okay. Get a chonda fresh, can we desensitize? No, uh, it's really forbidden for SJS and TA. We don't, we don't do desensitizing, rechallenging is uh, forbidden. It's since the patients are have a high risk of uh, mortality rate, as we have discussed uh, about 27% of Mortality rates is very high, so we don't do uh, desensitizing in this patient. Charanath Balata, clinical difference between TN and SGS. They are uh, on a same disease or clinical uh, spectrum, same disease spectrum. The difference between SGS and TN is only the involvement of the body surface area of epidermal detachment. So for SGS, uh, less than 10 percent. SGST and overlap from 10 up to 30, and if it's greater than 30, it's said to be TN. Otherwise, uh, they are on same clinical spectrum with different severity. And Hemu, if the patient was taking multiple drugs before SJ occurs, how do we know which drug causes the illness? Is there a testing? There are different uh, testing uh, algorithms for uh, to detect the high likely uh, culprit drug. The commonest one is the ALDEN, A-L-D-E-N, ALDEN, casualty score. So in this score, there are six uh, parameters, whether the drug is, has, is possible or very uh, probable or very probable for causing that disease. It includes the delay of, uh, from the initial drug intake and the clinical manifestation, it can, it can it also have a drug notoriety. Uh, it, it will rule out other possible etiologies 
and that is what we call the pre-challenging other uh, criteria are involved, included in the Alden casualty score so with this we can give score from minus three to three for different parameters and the total can be uh, seen from minus 12 up to 10. so for each drug if it's greater than four with the Alden score it's said to be very probable causing SGSMTA but otherwise some tests are uh, still on under research to detect the exact uh, causing uh, drug like the allergiologic tests in detecting uh, the lymphocyte uh, transforming test are very important to see otherwise there is no specific test rather than there is an algorithm the Alden algorithm is widely used yeah so thank you doctor i think we addressed almost all, all the questions yeah so on behalf of blue health ethiopia and all our participants we would love to thank you dr yarit for the nice presentation and it was indeed a clear and very informative session we hope we will see you in the future with other topics as well and if you have any last remarks that you want to address let me give you the chance one more time okay thank you so much it has been such a nice presentation in the q and they are very uh, eye-opening and i'm willing to come back again and uh, discuss on another dermatology condition especially the emergency conditions that are very important for health professionals thank you thank you very much and good night doctor Okay. Thank you. Have a good day.